Welcome to Under One Roof's Landlord and Letting Agent webinar series, made possible through the generous funding of the Safe Deposit Scotland Charitable Trust. The webinar will start momentarily. For those who are joining us for the first time, Under One Roof is a free independent service that supports landlords, letting agents, owner-occupiers, factors, local authority housing officers, and others throughout the sector with issues around owning and maintaining a tenement flat in Scotland. Last year, through funding from Safe Deposit Scotland Charitable Trust, Scottish Government, and local authorities throughout Scotland, we attained charity status, which has enabled us to hire full-time staff dedicated to working with landlords and owner-occupiers of tenement flats and those that support them. In the coming months and years, Under One Roof will be increasing the information available on our website, our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram accounts, and through our monthly newsletter. We encourage you to share information we send out with those in your building or in your sector to help us improve the quality of tenement flats in Scotland. Today's webinar will last one hour. We encourage you to post your questions and comments into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. The information provided in this webinar is designated to help you understand your rights and responsibilities and to understand what professionals tell you. Any technical information on repairs is designed to help you spot problems with your building and then understand quotations from builders so you can get the best job carried out for the best price. But every building and every group of owners is unique and so are their problems, which is why the information presented in this webinar can only act as a general guidance. It is not advice or a recommended course of action. When it comes to action, you should always seek professional help with anything more than a simple problem. More details and our legal disclaimer can be found in the About Us section of our website. Finally, if you are a housing professional wishing to record your attendance as CPD, please visit the webinar page on our website so you can log your participation and receive a confirmation certificate. Thanks for joining us. Let's begin. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Under One Roof Scotland's uh, ninth webinar for uh, landlords and letting agents of this uh, current session out of this end. I just want to introduce myself. I'm the voice you just heard, Mike Heffron, and I am the Chief Executive of Under One Roof Scotland. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, today's webinar will be on structural alterations in tenement buildings um, and all the various elements that come along with that. So we have uh, to start with today a interview that I conducted with uh, structural engineer Roger Story, who is a director, director of Story Structural Design in North Lanarkshire. And he is a chartered structural engineer who will be uh, talking a little bit about the role of a structural engineer and particularly around the issue of tenements, what he's found, what are common things that a structural engineer is engaged with when it comes to tenement buildings. Uh, once that video is done, Roger couldn't join us for the Q&A today, but he is more than ably replaced uh, by Scott Valentine, who is a structural engineer for Glasgow City Council. And he, uh, Scott, has extensive experience in working with tenement buildings. Uh, we're also very happy to be in, uh, joined by uh, Annie Flint and John Gilbert, uh, Under One Roof's tenement experts, who will also be able to uh, engage in that conversation around structural engineer al alterations and improvements. Uh, in your tenement buildings and be able to uh, hopefully get you some information um, and answer your questions as you send them on. We encourage you to, of course, send in questions uh, throughout the webinar. You can do so during the right now or uh, during the video or afterward during the discussion, uh, during the uh, course of the video, which should be about 15 minutes or, uh, long or so. You might get some, uh, raise some questions that you might have uh, that you'd like to see if the panel can uh, help you out with. So without further ado, uh, we'll jump in to that interview I conducted uh, with Roger last week, and uh, we'll see you in about 15 or 20 minutes to answer your questions. Thanks very much. Enjoy. Robert, thanks for joining us today. Can you first just talk through uh, what the role of a structural engineer is? The engineer is uh, really to advise on the structural stability of buildings and to assess their condition. And as it applies to the, the structure as a whole, it's not every part of the building that the engineer gets involved in, such as windows or doors or whatever, the bits of facade. It's, it's more the, 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 the load bearing elements of the building. So that's where the engineer's expertise lies. Um, and that can be, if we're talking about 
defects or repairs, then the engineer is able to advise on whether these defects are, have a, a serious implication regarding the stability of the property. And whether it's alteration work, um, the engineer will normally work in conjunction with other professionals such as architects and surveyors, advising again on the structural the implications of the work that's been carried out. And, uh, and, and, and in the end, if you like, when, when the work has been done to, to, to certify uh, that the work is uh, in accordance with regulations. So primarily it's about stability and condition of the property. When could a tenement owner expect to be working with a structure here? What are the scenarios? Yeah, yeah. Well, again, I, I suppose there's two main areas, but um, often it is, unfortunately, when there's defects that appear in tenements, um, that old properties, and like any property, it will uh, suffer some uh, deterioration over time. Uh, so it often the engineers uh, called in if there's an obvious defect, um, one that is showing concern and therefore maybe beyond uh, the expertise of a surveyor. Um, so so we, we get called in, as I say, if the defect becomes obvious, either through just natural deterioration. Um, we can talk a wee bit about other reasons for why defects might occur. Uh, we also get involved maybe when properties are being bought and sold and again, there's concern maybe over movement or what looks like a defect that goes beyond, again, the, the, the expertise of the surveyor and the, so the engineer is able to maybe comment better on that. Uh, but the other area that I get involved in a lot as well is alterations to properties. If people are doing a, a conversions, a taking down walls and things like that. So, that, so again, the engineer is the one. As I said earlier, you have to, you know, that, that's probably where you, you come across as most often. When, uh, I mean, are tenement buildings more challenging to work with, uh, you know, due to factors such as age or potential heritage status or? Well, yeah, yeah they are because uh, I think the, it's like in any uh, field of work, you should really uh, look to appoint someone who's experienced in that area. And the tenements have their own particular uh, aspects that the uh, engineers need to be wary of. And yes, the age uh, is, is a factor because at the time the tenements were constructed, they were constructed in a different way than you would construct buildings today. Often there is a lack of physical time between elements that we, we insist on today when we, we're building new buildings. And that doesn't mean necessarily that the buildings are less robust, in fact, obviously they stood the, the, the test of time and I mean they are um, robust structures but um, unless you're familiar with that type of construction you, you may you could maybe take a more conservative view so it's important to get an engineer who's important who's who's aware of the, the construction type so yeah there, there's certain historic uh, construction techniques that you need to be aware of um, when you're assessing assessing tenements and looking at tenements um, but also just simply from their age, they, they, they will, as I said earlier, deteriorate. And so you do find um, you have to have some sort of um, appreciation of, of, of that deterioration process and how significant it is. And therefore, often it's a case of not overreacting when it comes to tenements. You, just, you have to accept, you know, as a people might call it character, you know, in the building, <laughs> movements and cracks that you wouldn't accept in the new buildings, but they're not necessarily a problem. So yeah, they have their own particular challenges, I think, just to make sure that you, you take proper account of these. And from your experience, what are some of the more common areas of structural work in tenement buildings that you've worked on? You know, it seems to relate back to water ingress. That's probably one of the ways to look at it because, um, a, as soon as water is allowed to penetrate the fabric of a building, it causes all sorts of problems. And although these, maybe many owners will have heard about the type of repairs that have went, went uh, that, that, that they've seen carried out in, in, other, in other properties, actually a lot of them relate to the same type of this issue. So, so for instance, so, so water penetration into a tenement will cause rot. So we, we see rotting timbers in the roof structure, we see it in the floors. And uh, so that causes problem in those particular elements. But the floors and roof also provides support to the, the walls, for instance. And 
So it's not just the other way about, it's not just the wall supporting uh, the floors. So the lateral stability of a wall can be a, it can be affected by rotting of the floors, which causes the walls to move out. So quite often the type of defects that we see a lot uh, is that type of defect, lateral movement of walls, bulging of walls, gables, movement at bay windows, that type of thing, which is all quite common defects that happens simply, or maybe not simply, but happens a lot of it is due to, as I say, water ingress into the structure. So that's um, that's the type of defects we see a lot. And the other areas that I get involved is, is when people alter properties um, a, a, and there's been some, a, yeah, that bother me some advice regarding altering property, but also you get defects arising because either work has been done um, incorrectly and caused some problem above or below. And um, and other other things like maybe something cha has changed around the building. Mm -hmm. That could be a new road. It could be you know it could be new construction activity. It could be something something like that that's actually impacted on the property. So you know we, we get involved there as well. I've seen defects occur simply because a new building has been constructed next to an old tenement. Um, yeah, and, and subsidence is the other one. Uh, particularly in the west west of Scotland. So that's mm. the, the, probably the main areas that I get involved in. And how can owners of tenement in tenement buildings ensure the stability and strengths of their buildings? What are things that they yeah. can do? Yeah, well, as I said, water ingress is is a, a, a main factor in the a durability. A, I mean, with know, water egress, is that simply just a matter of just you know, regularly checking the gutters and and yeah, it's making, water well, not coming. My out. recommendation to 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 owners is to have the property inspected regularly. Mm. Uh, normally, uh, you would expect a good inspection every five years by a competent person, someone that knows what they're looking for, and you're checking, you know, to make sure there's no things that look minor to a uh, you know a layman, things that look that don't look very significant, like a a, a fine crack. A, a missing slate, mm. a gaps in windows, you know, where there's been, um, you, you know, just the ceiling has come out. out. These are they seem small, but they lead to bigger things if, if we're not careful. So so the other thing we say to people is uh, carry out inspections after main events, main storm events, because then, you you know, ridge plates or, you know, slates or, uh, you know, that, that you, you know, you see things, you know, come off the buildings, which you, you can't really protect against. These are these, these are isolated elements and they, they're not really that significant structurally, but they can lead to, to long term problems. Um, simply water penetrating, for instance, with a, 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 a for instance, from, from a gutter that's blocked, mm. you know, that gets behind into the behind the, in the natural stonework can get find its way between the stonework and between there's a gap there between the stonework that allows it to filter down. And that, that water getting into that area, freezing and thawing, can cause a lot of real, you know, major problems. So sort the small things would be my advice. Uh, inspect regularly. And when you do see an issue, uh, get someone, you know, who knows what they're talking about to, 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 to review it. Um, there's always, I think, sometimes a reluctance to involve maybe a, a professional engineer because they may highlight bigger problems or something, but that's that, that's kind of short-term thinking. You deal with the, the, the small problems, and I think you'll avoid the bigger ones in the future. What is that pathway to bringing in a structural engineer? So, you know, owners, it's important they work with uh, together with the other owners in the building, but what is the, the pathway for somebody in a representative from, from a building to, to actually bring in or contact uh, a structural engineer? Yeah, it, 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 I mean, Engineers like to, when I get appointed, I like to know that I'm going to get paid. <laughs> so, you, so, you, so you want to make sure that there is a point of contact. So that, that's good. I, I'm, I suppose I'm fortunate in many cases I'm dealing with maybe housing associations or um, factoring organisations that will take the responsibility of, of having to chase down the proportionate fees, if you like. You know, but an engineer doesn't really want to get involved in that, and it, it you know, it would put someone off. I think if if you're trying to approach them and you don't have the agreement of all, the, you know, people responsible for for paying the bill. So we we soon just know there is one point of contact. It's fairly straightforward to get an engineer. There are the organisations. The best one to probably 
to, to look at is Institute of Structural Engineers. They'll have a list of engineers that you can you can you'll find in your area. Um, local authority will also have some uh, uh, recommendations. Um, and the other probably uh, area I would look for is is, is called SCR, so Structural uh, Engineers Registration. They deal particularly with um, in new new buildings eh, or, or uh, new work. You know, so if you're altering, you're doing some alteration to to a flat, then the SCR site would give you the name of registered certifiers are able to to you know to to, uh, to certify that type of work. So the, those are the main ones, you know, Institute of Structural Engineers SCR registration. Um, and you know, and if you 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 know, I've, I've, I have been in the past involved with private owners who can't get agreement, you know, from from other owners and. That is difficult, um, and uh, and what uh, what I've been asked to do on a couple of occasions, and it's worked out. I think okay is that okay. Someone has to take responsibility to get that initial inspection, which may not be too expensive, but but often it, often there's someone more affected than others with a defect. You know, a top floor flat maybe when there's water ingress from the roof. So it's not been the first time that I've been asked to go out by the top floor flat owner to look at something that may be a bigger issue. Uh, but to get over the line, you know, to make sure that, you know, there is a defect there before we involve everybody, it's been that single appointment, but um, so that's the various ways that I've been involved, you know. And finally, I mean, is there examples, maybe just the opposite of that, where you'll get calls with people thinking, oh, I need a structural engineer for this, and in reality, actually, it's either something else or it's actually something sort of much more minor that they wouldn't need to bring in a structural engineer. What would Absolutely, you yeah, I, yeah, no, you're right, Mike. I think the um, I, most cases uh, I'm getting called out to things that are not really structurally important hmm. uh, because people do get worried about fine cracks in buildings. Now, that's not to say they shouldn't have called me out because. Um, if these cracks, particularly if the cracks are new, you know, engineers are always more concerned about progression of the uh, defects rather than the defect itself. It's quite often, is it how much has it moved uh, and is it going to continue to move? Because the buildings themselves, old buildings, you, you know, they, they do show cracking, as I said earlier, you know, it's a part of their, uh, you know, uh, their attraction to some people that they do don't look, you know, you know straight and plumb. And, and, and things, what happens over a period of time, stresses build up in buildings and suddenly there'll be a little bit of movement. And once that's happened, then it possibly won't move any further. Um, and you do get natural finishes that show cracking. So people do work to a flat or buy, buy a new flat, move in, don't realise that someone has just painted and decorated and that, that crack appears. So, it, you know, quite often the defects are minor and there's no serious work required. Uh, and that's really where it comes back to having an engineer who's experienced, you know, and knows <clears throat> not to overreact to defects. Uh, and it's quite important with uh, with old buildings, you know, let them do their thing to some extent. So uh, it often happens. Great, Robert. Well, thanks very much for uh, taking the time to, to speak with us today. And that was Robert's story. Uh, thanks again to Robert for for joining me the other day in uh, talking through those um, the basics of um, being uh, as far as the work around a structural engineer and how that engages with uh, tenement buildings. Uh, now we're going to bring in uh, a couple of our uh, other guests today. Uh, we've got Scott Valentine, uh, who's going to join us. Scott is, uh, like I said, a architect or sorry, a structural engineer for uh, Glasgow City Council. Uh, welcome, Scott. Hello, everyone. And uh, we've also got uh, John Gilbert, uh, a our resident architect here at Under One Roof. Um, Scott, maybe I thought I'd throw this out to both of you just just to get your thoughts first from you, Scott, as a as a fellow structural engineer, um, and anything that that uh, Robert brought up that that sort of struck you as far as uh, something that would be important to sort of hammer home, and then I'll, I'll throw it over to John as well. Yeah, well. <laughs> He's um, made a thorough job of explaining the role of the engineer um, for a start, but um, 
and they pointed out that we can be involved as a reaction to defects, um, but also um, to provide advice regarding proposed alteration work. Now, as far as um, reacting to defects, um, you know, we could discuss examples of um, uh, defects that um, you know might concern the owners of the, the, the flats. Um, Towards the end of the, the video there, Robert spoke about um, cracks in buildings. And I would say that was possibly one of the more common um, defects that concern people. Um, some of them are insignificant. Some of them more, um, lar the larger and more ongoing cracks um, can be more significant, but I would just, uh, you know, we back up what Robert said that, yeah, it's, it's a good idea to get an engineer to look at these things. Um, and then it puts your mind at rest and gets you the advice from a professional who can make a, a competent um, judgment. Um, so, yeah, cracks can be, you can, you can have a diagonal crack up an internal wall. Um, you can have a you can have cracks opening up between adjacent components um, and in all sorts of places, but get some doubt to have a look at them. Um, the other thing which um, is common is um, erosion of um, the, the stonework on the outside of the building, and this can cause um, structural problems. Um, for instance, to the mullions and lintels, the wood bearing elements around the walls. Um, it can cause pro particular problems around bay windows and audio windows. Um, erosion of stonework itself is not actually really structural. It's not really a structural matter, but it's if it gets to a stage where it causes a structural matter, a structural problem that that's you know that's that's where we have to become concerned so um millions and lintels in particular um they need to be they need to make sure that they don't get overly corroded um and lintels as well come back to cracks they can become cracked um if there's a flaw in the stone or or whatever um the best way of rectifying um, eroded or cracked lintels and mullions is just simply to take them out and replace them. Um, the other thing that you'll see from outside uh, uh, the external face of a building from time to time is um, bulges in the walls um, or the wall leaning out at the head up at the eaves. Now, these things occur because when these buildings were built 100 plus years ago, they were built by developers and builders who they didn't really understand structural action. They didn't think of tying the building together adequately. The external wall, walls are really only tied back, um, usually by um, the floors, and it's just the, the floor joists built into pockets in the walls. Now, once that um, tie fails, there's nothing much um, holding the external wall in place. Um, so you can sometimes get a bulge or a, a, a leaning out of the wall, which can cause cracking as well. Um, and these 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 um, points of contact where the, the, the joists sit into the walls, they often fail because of what Robert was mentioning there, water ingress and rot and rot, joist, um, joist ends become rotten, um, so the, 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 they're no longer um, fully tied into the walls and um, the walls are, are free to move. Um, so that's something that's very common um, and I would recommend you get an engineer to look at that. The, 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 the way that is usually rectified is um, the walls are tied back. Well, you would you would make good any rot work, uh, uh, any rotten joists, cut and splice, 
the, the, the rotten joist ends. And you would tie the walls back using metal straps and uh, rods back to the floor. Um, you could also try and tie them back to any um, adjacent um, walls inside. Um, and in the worst cases, the wall might have to be taken down, the external wall taken down and rebuilt. Um, maybe just like full, uh, half height, or maybe not necessarily full height. Um, another problem with external walls, of course, is that um, and th this really apply only applies to gables, is flues, chimney flues. If you can imagine you've got a gable wall and there may be you know, um, two fireplaces at each floor level, which could result in eight flues um, running up the gable wall. So an awful lot of voids um, in the wall. And um, that can weaken the, the structural integrity of the wall. It can allow water ingress down the wall and all the problems associated with that. Um, so that would be another problem with uh, external walls. Um, I'm really painting a bad picture here for... <laughs> <laughs> I could go on and on. Um, so, rockworks. Um, obviously, water ingress um, is... Um, it's not good for these buildings. There's a, there's a lot of timber. Um, you get the timber roof trusses, they, they are often rot affected. Um, the, f the floor joists, if the water percolates down the building, um, there can be timber plates built into walls. Um, they, they're called leveling plates and we would never think of doing anything like that in this day and age. Um, and if you have uh, rot in a leveling plate, you have to um, cut them out locally and pack them. Um, the timber Bressema beams around bays uh, and dorios, which are the big beams that support the um, the floor joists. Um, and then you've got the timber safe lintels at the windows, um, which are the lintels that support the inner part of the external walls, because obviously it's a stone lintel and the outer skin of the external wall. So all these things can become rot affected. And um, so you've got the problem of those structural components being rotten, but then you've got the secondary um, defect that they can occur if they, if they get to a stage where they, they for, for example, um, they crush, because obviously rotten timber can crush and that can allow that can allow the, the, the wall to move. Um, so that, that's rot. Now, so if you suspect that you've got a problem due to rot, then um, I suppose there's two routes. You can get a, um, a rot expert out initially, um, and then a structural engineer. Um, but you would probably you would need both. You would need both at some point. Um, other defects um, internally, as Robert mentioned there, people are prone to do it, making alterations to their flats. Um, one of the most common ones was um, uh, altering um, bed the bed recesses. Uh, making them into kitchens or bathrooms. Um, so you have to make sure that you do it in such a way that um, you take account of the load path and the, and you don't redistribute the stresses down the walls. In other words, um, putting beams in appropriate places. Um, personally, I don't think that putting a beam in, making a slap and putting a beam is satisfactory. And I think you have to put a steel goalpost and spread the load in the same way that it was originally spread down the building. Um, and you rarely see it done that way. Um, so if you're making any alterations to any walls internally, 
make sure that they're not load bearing and most of the walls in tenements are load bearing. Um, even if they're just supporting the wall above uh, and then in the next flat above, um, most of the walls are load bearing in, in, in one form or another. So you need to make sure for a start, you get an engineer in, he'll make sure it's uh, uh, making an assessment whether it's a load bearing wall or not and what is required for you to, to make an opening, new doorway or whatever in, in that wall. Um, if it's a non load bearing wall, then you shouldn't really have any problems. Um, but as I say, most of them are, are load bearing. Um, making any structural alterations, of course, um, requires you to um, apply for a building one. So yeah, um, you need to make sure you can do that. An engineer can provide the uh, appropriate um, proposals, drawings, supporting calculations to submit to building control for that. Um, other things I've come across internally that might be worth mentioning. Um, pen check stairs and um, some of the um, tenements have uh, an unusual construction in terms of the stairs um, that, that, that run from the ground floor to the top flats. There's no central wall supporting the treads, so the treads don't span from the outer wall of the, the, the stairwell into a central wall. They support each other, if you like. They're built in at one end, um, and they're not even a true cantilever because they support each other because they, they, they usually curve up. Um, it's not a rectangular um, uh, stairwell on plan. And the problem with these is that it's not an entirely satisfactory arrangement structurally. And over time, these um, stairs, which may have um, a wee bed of mortar where one sits on the next, um, that might fall out. Um, um, and the stair, as I say, the treads support each other, so they're no longer supported. And they fail. Now, if these things fail, they can fail like that. You know, the, the, the stair flight can just collapse, and they have done. Um, so some of the jobs I've been involved in, we've put in um, additional steel supports to the underside of the pen check stairs. Um, it's a good idea to do so, even before there is a problem. Um, it's something I would, re I would recommend. Um, it's not a case of, oh, there's a defect, let's, in that stair, we'll, we'll uh, address that. It's just, it's a good idea to do it because of the nature of the failure. Um, right. Um, There's plenty to go there. Actually. No, you, you covered a lot of stuff, and I just wonder if, um, John, you wanted to pick up on on anything there because there's a, a a large amount of really useful information. There. Yeah. Um, well, I, I I want to start by saying if you were getting a, a five yearly inspection by a building surveyor or an architect, they would probably highlight what areas needed a structural engineer uh, rather than just going mm -hmm. up all night a structural engineer for something. I mean, it's good to have that uh, five yearly inspection. So uh, you would get that uh, professional advice to use a structural engineer. Now, the other thing is um, moisture in the wall. Uh, because with climate change, we're getting increased moisture. It's not just timber that is uh, getting dry rot and uh, lots of adhesion of the wall. Cast iron, which is embedded in the wall, sometimes as lintels. Um, uh, particularly under close uh, close entrance, it starts to corrode, uh, and any iron in the uh, linking together lintels or corbels or anything like that may corrode, and then bits of stone will flake off and drop off and hit the street. So that's becoming increasingly a bit of a problem. And remember, all those orioles that we have in 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 Glasgow, they've got a cast iron plate 
uh, embedded in the stone. And, and sometimes you can see this on the underside, but sometimes it's bedded into the stone and that starts to corrode a bit and then throws, throws the stone off. So that's an increasing problem. Um, so those are the main things. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, I concur with, with what uh, Scott is saying. Mm. The, the audio window one is uh, an interesting one, but I've been involved in quite a few jobs where, where that has occurred and um, it's got to the stage where the audio is actually leaning out into the road and it's a case of um, road shut, emergency propping, put in, put in place, etc. Um, so yeah, um, a five year inspection may have caught that before it would get to that stage um so yeah good idea the other thing you see sometimes you get cracks at lintels uh, on the stone outside now what that sometimes suggests is that the the load uh well the, the, there's rot inside the safe lintels have been infected and they've they've lost their strength so the load of that wall has transferred to the outer stone lintel and cracked it. So it's not always the case, but you want to be careful of cracked lintels when you see on the outside, because there might be something happening on the inside. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and this one, one, sorry, Mike. Go ahead, go ahead, Scott. What we'll do is, why don't you just, uh, you can finish up on this and then what we'll do is we'll get to a couple of the questions. Yeah. Um, it's, it's always been my opinion as well that you shouldn't ignore cracked cells. Um, a lot of people just uh, think of the lintels and the millions um, as a load bearing elements, but um, if you can imagine a cell that is almost like an inverted um, lintel, mm -hmm. so it's like a steel goalpost arrangement, you know, if you were designing a steel goalpost arrangement. So the load gets transmitted down in the millions and into the cell, and then that cell um, transmits the load um, in the same um, load path that it was coming down before it hit the top of the window. So they are, to a certain extent, load-bearing elements. So... You know, if you look at round about a window and the, the cells and the millions look pristine, but the, sorry, the, the lintel and the millions look pristine, but the, the cell is um, badly um, eroded. We don't think, oh, well, it's just the cell, you know. The, there, is a, there is potentially a problem there. It's not as bad as if the lintel or million were affected, but yeah, potentially a problem. Well, thanks, both of you. We've got uh, a few questions that have come in. Uh, first one's going to come from uh, Billy, who is in South Lanarkshire, I believe. And uh, Billy's question, uh, question is sort of a comment and a question. So it's something that you can sort of, the two of you can sort of um, sort of comment on once we're done. But uh, I'm done with the question here. Uh, Billy says, I have a flat in an old blonde sandstone building and rendering has been falling off. Uh, had some trouble complaining uh, with the, to the factor, uh, not getting much of a response. Uh, last December, a uh, million fell off onto the pavement. No, luck, Luckily, no one was injured or worse killed. Um, definitely lucky there. Uh, South Lanarkshire Council eventually put up extensive and expensive support scaffolding to protect pedestrians and the building. Uh, unfortunately, three commercial properties uh, refused to engage with the factors for repairs, which were estimated are around 180,000 pounds, although four flat owners had paid their share up front. Uh, the factor, due to the lack of co cooperation from the commercial, gave up factoring the property. So now they're having problems getting insurance. So there's just sort of a cascading problems that have come across on this. Council are looking at the building at the moment to decide the way ahead, repair or possibly, unfortunately, demolition. Uh, and Billy's had two separate bills in for scaffolding, uh, each for 800 pounds, and also has advice from a solicitor for another 500 pounds, wanting another 500 pounds to, sh to chase up the commercials and the council. So Billy's, it's more of a comment rather than a question, but there's something that probably the two of you can can sort of talk a little bit about the importance of, which is his advice is to always keep, uh, always look at keeping the property up to scratch as it adds value and it keeps everyone safe. Yeah, well, the first thing I would say um, 
to sweeten that. So they've put up a support scaffold to protect protect pedestrians and the building. I'm assuming there's also, they must have put up some sort of temporary propping as well with a stone millions falling out. But, um, where was it? Uh, uh, the, the council are looking at repair or possible demolition. Now, I'm assuming that the demolition, if they're looking at possible demolition, it's not just because of a million's falling out. Um, so there's, there's, you know, there, there, there's something we don't know about here, unless it's a demo, demolition for another reason, just to, to, um, you know, they're, they're looking at clearing buildings from there or something, but not for a, a million uh, having failed. Um, so I'm, a, I'm a bit baffled by, by that. In terms of the, um, maybe John can advise and, uh, <laughs> um, um, well, uh, yeah. it, it, he says that uh, the, the, the rendering is falling off. I, I should, I suggest this, these are just stone repairs or, that are cement yeah. falling off, not render because it's a stone building. So I don't think it's that, uh, Yes, it may be emollion that's defective, but uh, presumably that can be fixed. I think the main thing that is lacking, and it'll add to your cost, is a, an engineer's report, which really analyzes what the problem is and what needs to be done, because that puts it in context and it'll tell you exactly what has, is required uh, and what are were common repairs, which this looks like a common repair. So the commercial owners would be liable. Now, of course, there may be that the ownership of the building is the deeds of condition, uh, and it, it's unfairly distributed to the commercial owners who have to pay a whacking amount. Uh, that may be the main problem. Um, so I think some this this is one for Annie really. Uh, I, I don't know what the the share distribution is and w whether that is hesitating, the, the, the commercial owners are hesitating because of the costs involved. Um, and you may ha have to look at that. Why don't we, uh, we'll go on to another question that we've had and it sort of actually touches on the points you were making before. Um, and then what we can do is, um, Annie's here, uh, we'll bring her in and we've got a couple questions that she may be able to help us uh, provide some answers for as well once we've answered this question. This is from Robert Strain who asked, can you preemptively check hidden elements such as floor joists, timber lintels easily slash cheaply or is it always a case of having to wait until any defects become obvious? Uh, you know, you can check. You can check the uh, certainly the safe lintels, the timber safe lintels inside. You can drill into them and see how uh, you know how safe they are. Basically, uh, you can take small core samples of the timber. The floor joists are a wee bit more difficult because really you you need to lift the floorboards at the outside. You can uh, get a a boroscope and drill holes and look there, but it is very difficult to see. So I think it, it's probably better to risk, lift the floorboards uh, near the edge and have a look at the floor joists. But I, I wouldn't do that automatically, you know, unless there's clear movement or other signs of a defect. Uh, uh, that, that is quite uh in, in, involving quite a lot of work. So uh, I think, yes, look at the safe lintels, first of all. If it, obviously if it's not in a safe lintel, you might suggest there's going to be rot in the floor joists as well near it. But I think um, looking at Robert's question, um, you, you you can't check for rot without affecting the finishes in some way, you know. Um, so it's, it's going to have to cut into the wall or drill into the wall or whatever. And even opening up uh, the four joist ends, you won't get a definitive answer just by looking at the joist because the most, the, the, the first place that 
the joist is going to be rot affected is right at the end within within the wall pocket so which you, you can't see um so um you you only see the rot as it becomes worse and um extends along the joist so thank you both for that um why don't we bring annie in um because we've got a couple of questions that sort of sort of touch on issues around uh, tenement management. Hello, Annie. Hi, everyone. Hi there. How are you all? Thanks for joining us. Um, we have got uh, there's a couple of questions here um, that I thought that um, uh, John Scott might be able to touch on, but Annie, you're, you might have uh, be able to give sort of a, a first go at. Um, we had a uh, question from Anne Halsey who asks, uh, "We have a." Ground floor and basement flat in a stone built building. Uh, the wall at basement level supporting the close wall is disintegrating. Um, and it, the bulge in the wall, there was a bulge in the wall originally, but it finally cracked, is now falling down. Having had a structural engineer report, uh, the problem is the other owners in the building are being tardy about paying for the structural repairs required. Do you have any advice on how to encourage owners to pay? or if the council will put a repairs notice on the building. Okay, well, let's let's crack off on, on the repairs notice uh, element of that, first of all. Um, not a lot of councils will use repairs notices now, far less often than they used to, because it, it does often put them under an obligation to offer grant, at least morally, if not legally. Um, what local authorities do prefer to do now is to is to use what they call missing shares. So if you go about your repair, getting all the, following all the correct procedures to get other owners on, on board, and, uh, and, and owners, uh, the council will, will give you guidance on that. And if you get council consent to using this before you start on the repair, then a local authority will often be able to step in and say they will pay the missing shares of those owners who can't or won't pay. Um, and because they will not only charge the owners for the cost of the repair, but they'll also charge an admin fee and often quite a whacking interest charge of about 8%, you'll find that owners tend to realise very quickly that it's worth doing things on a voluntary basis. So I would say, Anne, if you're, if you're having trouble trying to get people on board, speak to your council about missing shares. Now, if you're in an area where the council won't do that, then you're kind of going down the classic enforcing repairs route. And I would say here, this sounds like a critical repair and the duty to maintain would work. And, and the duty to maintain says that owners are required to carry out repairs which are essential for support and, and safety in, in their building, so support and shelter in their building. And this clearly fits under the support bit. The problem with that, though, is that some owners are going to have to, you know, effectively cough, cough up on behalf of those owners who aren't paying to get the repair carried out and then go back to those owners and, if necessary, take court action to try and get the bill, you know, get the bill paid by those non-participating owners. And you might end up having to sort of put a charge on the building to get that cash back if owners are just being really reluctant. So, yes, there are mechanisms. Um, but I think really once you start you know, taking some kind of action and make it quite clear to owners that you're being serious, that you are not going to let this go. Um, and that you know, people could find it a lot more expensive if they don't participate in a voluntary way, then people will tend to, sort of, to fall in with you. Um, so keep going at it, Anne. You know, um, I mean, we've always given advice. It's better to talk to owners first of all, you know, keep trying, but just make it quite clear that you will take action if they don't respond, and if you need to, you send them copies of pages from 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 the website saying this is what I'm going to do. Here are the implications for you. You know, just keep going at them, man. But those are the methods that that you can use. Thanks, Annie. Scott, John, is there anything you wanted to add to that? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> um. Uh, on that too, so, so uh, she commented, Annie. She said that uh, says that uh, missing shares are not available for tenements with less than eight flats. Is that correct? 
No, I don't. I don't think that's true. Um, but it may depend on the local authority in question, because each one of them will develop their own rules and regulations. So for some, they may say it, it's only going to apply where the repair is over a certain amount, because you know it's it's quite costly to the local authority to go about doing these things. That they're not going to use these powers for very minor repairs. So. There's nothing in the law, or the legislative or regulations that says that it's got to be for tenements under a certain size. But this may be what the local authorities' own particular rules are. Um, those rules can be changed. You know, local authorities can make exceptions to those rules, particularly if it's something significant where, you know, they might be involved in having to carry out other interventions such as dangerous buildings notices. Um, you know, keep going at them. And there's a lot of th those councils have a lot of discretion, right? Not only, uh, well, first of all, not all councils have the missing share. So you should check your, your local council to see if it has it. Um, but there's a lot of discretion even there around the issue of uh, how much they're willing to, to pay. I know from having conversations myself uh, just recently is that there was a missing share scheme in the council, but the, the cost of the repairs the implication, I think, was was that the council wasn't willing to cover the the missing share because it would take up a huge chunk of their missing share budget probably for the year, mm. and therefore they wouldn't be able to spread that out <laughs> uh, with as many owners because it would just be for that for that one building. So there's also a discretionary element to it, but it's definitely it's certainly worth looking into. Um, and I know that even in places where they they don't have a missing share scheme, I believe it's down in the borders, they have a pilot scheme going. So they're looking at bringing this in as well. Yeah, but I mean, just always check with your local authority, first of all, you know, don't take these things as read. Um, you've always got to get their, their consent to use these things before you start on the repair. Once you've got going, once you've got tradesmen in there doing the work, then a local authority is, is not going to help out. They just don't have the powers at that point. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Annie. I've got another question for you, if you don't mind me firing your your way. Um, and this is really uh, Angela's. Uh, we popped it into the the Q and A, and it's a it's a long question with a lot of sort of, of really interesting um, and uh, detail about the the situation. But it largely boils down to what do you do in a situation where you are part of a building and there are owners that are making decisions um, without consulting with the full group. And so decisions are being made. There is an actual, you know, call it a quasi owners association, but in reality, it's just a group of owners. They're, they're coming together, they're making decisions, they're getting the quotes, and then they will put something to the full group at the end as they are required to do. But there's no there's no input into that, that process. What do you do if you find yourself one of those owners that are sort of are sitting outside of that that small group that are seemingly making those decisions. Yeah, um, I mean, in many ways, this is a situation which a lot of other owners would just love to have. You know, the big problem that a lot of people have is they cannot get other owners on board, but there is no leadership in the tenement. There aren't people willing to put their heads on the line and go out and get things done. You know, most people would actually envy this situation. So. I would say to Angela, first of all, just approach this carefully because you really want to keep these owners doing the right things, which in many ways they are doing. I think you just want to get them to just rein back a little and consult with people a bit more. So, yes, there, there are rules. So if it's maintenance, uh, and we've got definitions of maintenance on, on the website, those owners have to get the approval of a majority of owners. And if you've got the, the approval of a majority of owners, then the minority have to go along with that. So, so we don't know what kind of numbers we're talking about here. But maybe you should just gently go back to those owners and just remind them that there are procedures and that, and that you particularly are keen to get this building maintained, but you just don't maybe want to go quite as far as they do. You know, assure them they can count on your support as long as they're kind of going about things the right way and being reasonable. So the other question that would come up maybe is about improvements. So improvements is where you're putting in something which isn't there already, basically. You know, you're not just taking care of or repairing something, but you're 
improving something. You know, you're really changing or upgrading considerably what's there. Um, in that case, all owners have to agree. You know, you have to get 100% of owner's agreement. And, and again, you could just maybe remind, you know, your committee of owners just very gently that perhaps not everybody is wanting to do these things. Perhaps not everybody has the available income and that maybe they should just talk about it a lot more. I engage with them, you know, remind them gently about things. But I would say just to approach this carefully because you really do want these people there. You know, you want to keep them on board. You want to keep them doing things. You know, don't don't put them off. Don't put them in a situation where they feel, God, there's no point in doing this. I'm just giving up. Because that's, that is in some ways the last thing that you want in any tenement situation. Thanks, Annie. And thanks, Angela, for, for submitting your questions. I've got one more for you, Annie. And um, we still probably after this have probably time for one more question. So you have a question around structural alterations in your building um, or anything for Annie. Uh, please pop them in. Uh, Jean asks, what can be done when an owner will not grant access even for essential maintenance or where there may, or where there, where there may well be rot development? Yeah, I think there are duties to offer access where something is required, Jean. Um, I think just check on the website and see if, if that's there but um, and that we have covered it. And if not, we can, we can go back and, and just have a look at, over that again. But I, I think owners do have to uh, provide access to their properties on reasonable notice to allow for inspection and maintenance. Um, and it's it's in the Tenements Act. And I think you have a look, check out check out the, the provision and um, remind owners of that. Um, if they won't offer access, then I think I think the local authority may be able to help Jean. The local authority does have various powers. Again, I would need to look those up. But I do have somewhere on my computer the chapter and verse of this. But if you speak to the people in the local authority, whether it's kind of environmental health, public health, or the housing repairs section, um, if necessary, they do have powers they can use to force owners to, to give access. If the council can't or won't use those, then you might have to go through the uh, what they call simple procedures in, in the court to um, to persuade owners to, to go ahead and do these things. Uh, and in fact, that chimes in with another question I see we've got from Andrew about the costs of going to, to court, Mike. Um, if it's simple procedures, it's not very expensive. I think the last time I looked at about 72 pounds to lodge um, um, a, a court action and they they won't effectively pay for legal fees so you know it's not going to escalate in cost if you're going down the simple procedures route so maybe I've answered both those questions Mike <laughs> <laughs> uh, you may have actually just in one go there um, maybe what we could do is, is finish off um, I don't know if John is still here we may have lost him but um, Scott this is something that you probably could touch on is that um, just basically the the question we touched on a little bit earlier, but just focusing on when is when is time when is it time to call a structural engineer out? Um, and when is it, you, you know, you, you and this is information, it's not advice. So, you know, pick with it what you will. But, um, you, you know, and, and I'm thinking in particular, if you've got a long standing crack in the wall versus uh, that's been there, there's nothing going on um, that should have caused it. Um, but it just looks like it's it's always worried you and you, you wonder if you should have somebody come out versus a situation where there's ongoing building works in your building or the one immediately adjacent and suddenly a crack appears. Um, is there any sort of difference between those two situations and when you would call a structural engineer out? Um, okay. Um, the, 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 the second scenario there, um, there's uh, work being carried out within or um, adjacent to your building and suddenly a crack appears. Um, if, if the crack is reasonably significant, I would say, yeah, get, get a structural engineer out. You know, it's, it's always worthwhile. He may come out and say, no, that's nothing, you know. Um, um, 
you know, having said that, I've been asked to look at cracks in the past and you you, you go out and it's not adjacent work. It's somebody said, you know, the, the owner will say, oh, they changed the route on the number 10 bus that goes by now like 10 times a day. And that's, you know, the cracks appeared since then. And it's not, because it, I can look at the crack and see that it's an old crack. It's not ongoing. It, you know, things happen. People imagine, you know, they convince themselves that a crack must be happening. But if in doubt, yeah, get an engineer out, uh, or use your mind. Um, and it's the same with the, the, the first scenario. If, if, if you've got a crack that's been sitting there for a long time, even if it's not getting any worse, and if it's worrying you, then, you know, why not ease your mind? That's what I would do. Um, but if it looks like a really insignificant hairline crack that isn't getting any worse, then you're probably safe to assume that it's, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Great, Scott. Thanks very much. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll we'll call it a day for this one. Um, so I wanted to, um, first of all, just let people know we're not going to have our question and answer as we have been doing uh, the end of this month uh, due to the holidays. We'll return with those at the end of January. Um, and uh, we are, as far as speaking of January in the new year, our first webinar of uh, 2022 will be on Tuesday, January 11th, and that'll be uh, information on how to use the first tier tribunal. So sort of addresses the question uh, that Annie talked about as far as the costs of um, uh, going to court versus um, and what tenement owners, um, what options are available for tenement owners and how to use the first tier tribunal system uh, to your advantage to help resolve issues. Um, and we'll bring on a couple experts uh, uh, as well to, to answer uh, your questions um, on that. In the meantime, um, I wanted to thank everybody for um, sending in their questions. Uh, if there's anything you wanted to follow up with us on uh, as far as the webinar, um, please get in touch at info at under one roof dot Scott. We'll be posting this webinar up shortly on the webinar website and then uh, probably early in the in the year on the YouTube page as well. So you'll have an opportunity. If you had anything you wanted to go back and take a look at, you're, you are free to, to do so and share that on with any owners in your building or any other owners that you know. Uh, finally, I just wanted to thank um, Annie and John and Scott for taking part today. And um, also Jazz, uh, who's been helping out in the background, answer your question or get your questions organized and pu uh, posting information uh, to the group. So thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. Have a great holidays and we will uh, see you in the new year. Bye now. Bye.